I actually have two different chemicals in this bottle. One of them which is absorbing certain wavelengths of light. When I look at the light that passes through the bottle, I see all the colors of the rainbow that are unaffected by the chemical. So all the other colors except for red are absorbed by the material in the beaker. When I look at it at an angle, I see a color of light that's being given back to me in a process very similar to what we saw here, only called fluorescence, where the light is given back as a specific color. And so, depending on whether you see the colors that are absorbed or whether the colors that are uh, given back in fluorescence, you see a different color. So you can pass these around once again. Why don't you flip up the lights? I got a few of these to go around the room. I have to do this to keep my students awake in class, you know. So we're going to send a couple of these around each section. Uh, I got a few more things to pass around here. Uh, these are just kind of fun little, uh, talking about modern chemistry and modern technology, these are small uh, liquid crystal sheets that are temperature sensitive. The chemicals change their orientation depending on temperature. So if you place your hand on these, you can see your handprint, your fingerprint. Those are just kind of some fun things to pass around and play with. Uh, I have one last thing here that I want to send around. This is actually quite interesting. If you look inside each of these containers, and they will eventually make it around to you so you can see. Uh, I have a solution in this container, which is actually a solution, a suspension of very fine magnetic particles. That means that this liquid can actually be controlled with a magnet. And if you look at the material, you can move it around in the container with a magnet. You can even see the magnetic lines of force in the liquid. This is something we are not used to seeing every day, is a magnetic liquid. These are very fine particles of magnetite, iron oxide, and so we can control them with a magnet. The changes are, are the uh, research in terms of fine particle technology that are going on are amazing, and so you can expect to find these types of things in the future. Uh, the only thing I would ask is, that, is I pass these around, be very careful with them. Don't spill them. The material is not toxic, but it will make an unbelievable mess. It's impossible to clean up. You can't, you know, uh, wipe it up like you would any other material. Uh, the other thing that I ask is you don't take the magnet and paint the inside of the glass, because once you paint the inside, outside of the glass, you can't really see anything that's inside. But if you want to pass that around, it's really kind of fascinating. So, now that everybody's got a toy to play with, now we can talk a little bit about chemistry. Okay, so, let's talk a little bit about something that my students appreciate, the idea of solution. Everyone knows that if you take a chemical, you can dissolve it in some liquid, like water. Everyone here has made a solution at one point in their life. Think back to when you were a child, if you're a grown-up. Think back to making Kool-Aid. How do you make Kool-Aid? You take a cup of sugar, you dump it into a quart pitcher of water, and what happens to the sugar? It dissolves. Now, everyone here at one point, I'm sure, thought to themselves, gee, if one cup of sugar is good, <laughs> two cups of sugar should be better. What happens when you try to add that second cup of sugar into your Kool-Aid? It sits there on the bottom. There's a maximum amount of material that we can dissolve. We call that a saturated solution. I have two solutions up here of a chemical called sodium acetate. These chemicals have been tricked into holding more solid dissolve than they should be able to. This is what's called a super saturated solution. It's got more solid dissolve than should be there. And we can illustrate just how much solid dissolve is dissolved in a tiny amount of liquid. If I take some crystals of sodium acetate, I'm going to place these crystals on this table, and I'm going to pour out my super saturated solution. If I pour out my super saturated solution very carefully onto the crystals,
Now, unfortunately, I can't talk and pour at the same time. <laughs> the crystals, the solid dissolved in the liquid, crystallizes immediately upon contact. And so, maybe I should quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> Leaning yet? No. Yeah. Yeah. Straight. Well, it's got to be a record, so I'm going to quit. You almost died. I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. All right. The super saturated solution crystallizes the moment that it comes in contact with a crystal. Of the saturate of the sodium acetate material. Don't do that. All I need is one crystal. All I need is one crystal of sodium acetate dropped into the solution, and it will start the crystallization process. There's no way that I can stop it. There's no way I can stop that crystallization process once it starts. It's like a roller coaster going downhill. Now, if you feel the bottom of the beaker. It generates warmth. It's an exothermic reaction, that crystallization. There is one common home product that uses this type of super saturated solution crystallization to generate heat, to generate warmth. Does anyone know what it is? I heard somebody say it out there. Say again. Heating pack, hand warmers. Hand warmers are basically super saturated solutions. When you want warmth, you crystallize the material. By crystallizing the material, energy is released. You feel the warmth. And when you want to reuse them, you pop them in the microwave, warm them back up. The solid dissolves and they will stay in that state. You can feel the warmth generated because of the super saturated solution. All right. So that's a little bit about solution chemistry, saturated and super saturated solution. Uh, okay. How much of a mess is down there? Eh, not bad. Sodium acetate, never hurt anybody. Okay, uh, you guys seem to like combustion, so let's talk a little bit more about combustion. Let's talk a little bit more about combustion. I want to talk about the combustion of phosphorus. Here I have a small amount of phosphorus. A small amount of phosphorus. Phosphorus will burn if given the chance. I'm going to place a little phosphorus on that pedestal. And then I'm going to light it. Ah, right here. Here we go. Okay. Now, in order to burn, the phosphorus is going to need oxygen from the room. You've got to be ready to turn out the lights. The oxygen, we're going to need oxygen from the room, so you can light it, you can turn them out. Let's see here if I can get my lighter working. Ah, there we go. You can see the phosphorus will burn in the room, but if I supply a little bit of oxygen, the combustion is quite a bit different. The combustion of phosphorus in oxygen produces P4O10, and along with this brilliant Thermoluminescence. I call this the glowing orb of chemistry. <laughs> students, students wonder how I determine their grades. It's by staring into the glowing orb at the end of the semester. It has nothing to do with their exam scores. <laughs> because I have a closed system, because I have a completely closed system, this reaction can only go until one of the two materials runs out, whether it's the phosphorus or the oxygen. When one of those two materials is completely consumed, the reaction has to stop. This is an example of what we call a limiting reagent system. And so, as we start to wind down, one of those two materials is running out and the reaction has to <laughs> Sorry, there we go. All right. 